Um, so next up, we have Kirsten Travers Moffitt from Colonial Williamsburg. Take it away, Kirsten. Great, great. Thank you. All right. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm materials analyst at the Colonial Williamsburg Foundation, and I encounter arsenical greens in my work um, here, especially in our wallpaper and German toy collection. And I became involved with the Poison Book Project about a year ago when Megan Bryant at the College of William and Mary reached out to us about analyzing some suspicious green books in their special collection. And my talk today is going to be a little combination of some history and analytical um, work on Sheila's Green. In When We Cease to Understand the World, an incredible collection of essays about scientific discovery, ethics, and the line between genius and madness, the author described Carl Sheila, the Swedish German chemist, as, quote, a genius unjustly forgotten who endured bad luck his entire life. The chemist with the most discoveries of natural elements to his name, including oxygen, which he called fire air. He invariably shared credit for each of his finds with less talented colleagues who anticipated him in making their conclusions public. He worked with such love and extraordinary rigor that he went so far as to smell and even taste the new substances he conjured in his laboratory. And this bad habit cost him his life at the age of 43. He died with a ravaged liver, his body covered in blisters. These were the same symptoms suffered by thousands of children whose toys were painted with the dazzling green arsenic-based pigment that Sheila manufactured, unquote. Sheila's method of making his new green color was published in 1778, three years after his initial discovery. To make the pigment, he combined a solution of arsenic and white potash or potassium hydroxide to a solution of blue vitriol or hydrated copper sulfate. After standing for several hours, copper arsenite or Sheila's green precipitates out of solution and collects at the bottom of the vessel. Over time, others adjusted Sheila's method, varying the starting materials and processes to intensify the green color. While copper arsenite should be the primary coloring material, several other compounds could be present in the final product. And this is one issue that complicates its analysis. Another issue is confusion of terms. Once emerald green, copper aceto arsenite is available in 1814, it seems that the two names were used interchangeably to indicate any arsenical green, with the result that even the labels on historic reference materials are not always dependable. In fact, even while I was putting this presentation together, I noticed that the Raman spectrum for Sheila's green shown on a popular conservation website was actually emerald green, not Sheila's green. So it seems that there is a dearth of reliable Sheila's green for study. I was lucky enough to get a sample of Sheila's green from a colleague who made it using a historic recipe. And this is the sample that I'm going to show in my talk today. Sheila's green was used most widely in wallpapers and printing on fabric. I spent a lot of time searching all of our historic newspaper and document databases, but I found hardly any mention of Sheila's green pigment before the introduction of emerald green. I didn't look beyond 1814 because again, after that date, the terms are used so interchangeably. I did, however, find this article from Philadelphia dated 1810, which reports that large quantities of Sheila's green were produced in that city and sold under the name patent green. And of course I searched that too, and I found nothing. And there is this reference from 1847 describing a method by which Sheila's green, and they do seem to mean Sheila's green, not emerald green, was precipitated directly into cloth. This method might have some relation to book cloth manufacture, so I thought it worth mentioning. With non-destructive XRF, which many libraries and archives have been using to detect poison books, you will just see coppers, uh, peaks for copper and arsenic in both Sheila's green and emerald green. So for many of you, safety is the biggest priority. So just finding arsenic green in a book cloth cover might be all the information that you need. But I work at an institution whose collection spans the 18th through the early 19th centuries. So differentiating between the two pigments is very important in my work and accurately dating our collection. When I find that a green paint contains copper and arsenic, the method I first use to differentiate between the two 
is polarized light microscopy or PLM. PLM is a visual analysis technique that requires a very small sample, almost invisible to the naked eye. And luckily the two greens have very different characteristics under the PLM. Emerald green exhibits these distinctive green particles called spherulites, which are actually hundreds of small fibers arranged radially in a disc shape. Under a condition known as cross-polarized light shown here on the right, emerald green is anisotropic, meaning the particles are visible and quite bright. Sheila's green looks very different. The particles are a more yellow-green color and there are no spherulites. In fact, Sheila's green is non-crystalline or amorphous, so there are really no distinct particles, just green flakes of varying size. In cross-polarized light, it is isotropic, meaning we can't see it. So under the microscope, I noticed my sample wasn't all Sheila's green. There were some other particles present, and I'm showing these on the right. Um, these had a more blue hue and definitely um, more crystallinity, and they were quite bright and cross-polarized light as shown on the bottom right image. So I analyzed my Sheila's green sample with SEM EDS. And the Sheila's green particles are the more amorphous um, modeled flakes here. And they contained higher amounts of copper and arsenic. And by contrast, those crystals contain mostly copper and sulfur. And I think this is residual copper sulfate, one of the starting materials of the recipe, which Sheila called blue vitriol. FTIR, um, which Mark discussed, is another method for distinguishing between the two pigments, or at least confirming the presence of emerald green. Because emerald green has an acetate group, it has these two very sharp, strong peaks around 1557 and 1455. This spectrum is from the infrared Raman users group database, which had a number of entries for Sheila's green, but none for, or sorry, a number of entries for emerald green, um, but none for Sheila's green. So I had to look in various print resources and I found that the spectra published for Sheila's green were not consistent. When I ran FTIR of my Sheila's green sample, some of my spectra matched a blue copper sulfate mineral known as chalcanthite. And this confirmed that unreacted copper sulfate or blue vitriol was present in the sample. But my other spectra didn't really align with anything that was published. So like PLM, I think FTIR can definitely ID emerald green, but it may not always be appropriate for Sheila's green. I, there's still some more work to do. And as Mark demonstrated, synchrotron radiation um, seems very promising in this respect. And Ramon spectroscopy should be able to differentiate between emerald and Sheila's green as they have very different peaks. I don't have Ramon in my lab, but I got the spectra from the University College of London Ramon database. And I do want to note that my sample of Sheila's green was also analyzed with um, Raman, and it did align with the reference. So it is Sheila's green, despite my rather ambiguous FTIR results. So I mentioned in my abstract that one poison book had been found to contain Sheila's green, but since then, um, it's recently been reanalyzed by Rosie at Winterthur, and it turns out that it doesn't even contain a copper green at all. So I thought that I had found it also in this green wallpaper for, from our collection. So this green um, paper has a definite 18th century date and it contained pretty high levels of copper and arsenic. Uh, under the microscope, I thought that it was Sheila's green because it didn't have any spherulites and it was quite a lot of amorphous green. But the Raman data, again collected by Winterthur, doesn't align with Sheila's green but it doesn't align with emerald green either or any pigment for that matter. So perhaps this is another form of Sheila's green, one that is not yet in the Raman database. I can't explain it, but this is something I'm going to keep working on. But the bottom line is when it comes to instrumental analysis, it seems like it is easier to prove the absence of emerald green than it is to prove the presence of Sheila's green. I just wanna conclude by saying in terms of poison books, Yes, our, uh, emerald green is the arsenical green found so far on book clocks in the US and the UK. Um, but I'm interested in learning more uh, over the next couple of days.
And this makes sense because we know from Melissa's work that the industry of cloth book, book binding really takes off in the mid 19th century. And that's when emerald green is the most popular mass produced arsenical green. And yet archives are more than just books and Sheila's green could be present in other materials. And as word of the poison book project spreads, it would be wise to remember that not all arsenical green is emerald green. So before I close out for today, I just especially wanna thank Erin Shigar at the Buffalo Conservation Program for providing me with a sample of Sheila's green. Thank you so much.